Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us to the second session in our series, Palestine, uh, Israel, a history of oppression and rebellion. Um, tonight, we're looking at a question that if you are a socialist, a Marxist, you will have heard a lot, especially in the Corbyn years. Namely that, well, yes, as a socialist, yeah, you're anti-Semitic and look at that Karl Marx fella. He was anti-Semitic and don't you follow his, his uh, writings, etc. So it's not surprising that you lefty are an anti-Semite too. Now, I think we're looking at the question tonight, what is anti-Semitism, which we'll discuss, and was Marx anti-Semitic? I think we all know the answer already, probably not, <laughs> uh, unless he was a self-hating Jew. I mean, that seems unlikely, but uh, of course, we'll be discussing the question in more detail. And it is very important, I think, for our socialists to get it right, because this accusation will come up uh, over and over again in this period, in, in particular, when any criticism of Israel is uh, construct, construed as anti-Semitic wrongly. I mean, there are and there is anti-Semitism about, just like there's racism about, but, you know, being critical of the state of Israel does not mean automatically you're anti-Semitic. So tonight to introduce the subject to us is uh, Ian Spencer, who's looked at Marx's text on the Jewish questions, uh, on the Jewish question, and then some other texts as well. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, comrades. Um, this uh, essay written by Marx in 1843, uh, sorry, in 1844, um, was an important part of Marx's development, as we'll go on to see. Um, but the central thing that I'm arguing here is not only was Marx not anti-Semitic, uh, but that um, to understand the comments that he makes, uh, not only does it have to be placed in the context of the time, but in the context of Marx's own profound understanding of uh, history in general and Jewish history in particular, um, Isaac Deutscher described Marx, along with others such as uh, Sigmund Freud and Leon Trotsky, and as a non-Jewish Jew. Uh, so from the point of view of him being um, of Jewish heritage, but not religious, uh, uh, but still nevertheless deeply influenced by um, the rabbinical tradition that was part of his family. Um, so without further ado, um, Karl Heinrich Marx uh, was the son of Herschel Marx. Uh, Herschel Marx subsequently um, converted to Lutheran Christianity before Karl Marx was born. Um, and when he did so, he Germanized his name to Heinrich. Um, the Marx family had provided most of the rabbis to Trier in the years before Marx and indeed Herschel Marx were born. There was a long line of uh, rabbis, so his grandfather was a rabbi uh, and he had uncles who were rabbis. Um, so they were a, a non-religious family, but in, also it was partly in keeping with the fact that he grew up in that part of Germany, which had been uh, invaded by France and come under a brief period of the Code of Napoleon. So that there was a whole period of uh, life in Germany at that time, which had been influenced by uh, the ideas of the French Revolution. And of course, it was also a time of um, a autocratic monarchy uh, in Prussia. Um, and and uh, Many of the debates that we see in these early years of, of Marx uh, were debates around um, the coming into being, really, of, of liberal democracy, of uh, trying to realise the ideas of the French Revolution in the context of Germany still ruled over by kings and princes and electors and, uh, and coming under, of course, eventually uh, the overall uh, tutelage of um, the, 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 the Prussian Kaiser. Um, <clears throat> so when Heinrich Marx converted to Lutheran Christianity, it was largely to escape um, discrimination in Prussia. Um, his, uh, Karl Marx's mother, Henriette Pressburg, uh, his father was, uh, her father was also a rabbi. Uh, so 
Heinrich Marx was was not religious anyway, uh, and for, for him to convert to Lutheran Christianity uh, to evade the discrimination that was a, a feature of uh, Prussia at the time uh, was no great difficulty, really, as far as I can see. Um, in 1843, uh, Bruno Bauer, who was a, a, a right Hegelian, uh, as most of you will know, Marx studied uh, philosophy. Uh, he, he was originally supposed to be studying law. Um, at, that was his father's wish, uh, so that he could make a living, um, but, but instead became taken in by philosophy and pursued philosophical studies for most uh, right up to his uh, doctorate which was on Epicurus and Democritus uh, and a comparison between the two Greek philosophers um, <clears throat> so uh, De Judenfrage uh, of 1843 by Bruno Bauer uh, was as it was uh, part of that whole debate which Marx and Engels were having with the right Hegelians at the time the Hegelian um, Hegel really dominated German philosophy at the time uh, <clears throat> and kind of split so really uh, Bruno Bauer uh, remained pretty influential but tended to influence instead uh, people like the anarchist Max Stirner rather than um, someone like Karl Marx who was one of his most uh, trenchant critics. Um, do you um was was criticized by Marx, but there was also another essay uh, by Bruno Bauer. Uh, I won't attempt to the German. Um, the capacity of present day Jews and Christians to become free. And it's the critique of that second essay, uh, which Marx uh, makes a couple of a few statements which have been interpreted by some as anti Semitic. Um, but just to give an outline of what uh, Bruno Bauer was talking about, uh, he was really hostile to most religion. I mean, bear in mind, uh, we're living in a time when there were state religions in most, uh, in many states. Um, so uh, Austria was predominantly Catholic uh, and was you know, and was dominated by the Catholic Church, and some of the German states were too. Um, Others were Protestant, and there was a, 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 a lot of pressure to conform to either to, to Lutheran Protestantism or Catholicism. And from that point of view, uh, Bruno Bauer, who is also accused of being anti-Semitic, um, is also critical of Christianity. Um, not only did uh, Marx and Engels uh, criticise Bauer, uh, but also more extensively in The Holy Family, which they published in 1845, uh, and, and again in... Um, the German ideology, which, as you know, was never published and left to the gnawing criticism of the mice. Um, so Bell was really trying to argue that in order to have religious emancipation, um, the thing to do is to give up being religious, and in particular, give up being Jewish. Um, he was arguing in the second essay, the capacity of present day Jews and Christians to become free, and in the sense that Jews had... Um, more of a task on, on uh, in hand than Christians did. So from the point of view of uh, Judaism being an earlier version of Christianity, uh, they had further to go, as it were, in, uh, in relinqu relinquishing their religion. And uh, was arguing really that it was about what was at stake was liberal democracy and, and the universalism of being a citizen. In order to be a citizen, um, one is Bauer was arguing one has to be free of religion uh, to be fully a citizen. Um, Marx, as we know, uh, was critical of that uh, and we'll look at the reasons why. So in order to be a, a, a citizen, questions like religion shouldn't come into it. And again, we go look at the, uh, uh, um, the, the French Revolution and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which makes uh, being religious or not a, a personal matter it becomes a part of civil society rather than being a part of political society as part of as part of the state so um in these two essays uh bruno bauer um puts forward a case uh for becoming more of a citizen by relinquishing one's religion and in particular uh the jews and, and the argument goes something like this um we Christians are not liberated, so how can you expect us to liberate you, as it were? By contrast, 
Um, the Jewish question on the Jewish question by Marx zur Judenfrage, uh, published in 1844 in the Ger German French Yearbook, which is a journal which only had one issue published, but nevertheless had quite a significant um, impact. Um, not only was um, Zu Judenfrage uh, published in this edition, but also um, the introduction to a contribution of the critique of Hege Hegel's philosophy of right, uh, which I'll mention a little more later. Um, but also Engels' first uh, foray into uh, the critique of political economy. And remember, it was Engels rather than Marx who was the first one to write a critique of political economy. And it was Engels' contribution to this critique that so impressed Marx, that impressed Marx so much that they became firm friends and lifelong um, collaborators, collaborators on the communist project. But in, in a sense, all of these essays were written before either of them were really a communist. They would have identified as a socialist or something or on the left in some respects, and certainly critical of the state enough to get them into trouble. Um, but uh, it was really in a period when what was at stake was the development of a modern bourgeois republic uh, with the freedoms from uh, feudalist in interference in one's private life it, of um, the, the 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 rights of the the citizen uh, to to be free from arbitrary detention, arbitrary expropriation, and so on. Um, so this was quite a, a significant period in the development of uh, the thinking of Marx and Engels. And um, so you have uh, the the two parts of Zu Judenfrage. Um, the first was really a, 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 an analysis of the dual nature of the citizen, and in the front, in the in the in the actual um, essay itself, uh, on the, uh, the the living individual, the human, concrete individual, and the citizen, citoyen, uh, are addressed. So, for Marx, uh, there is this dual nature in what it is to be. A citizen in the context of a, a liberal democracy, the, the living individual and also the citizen, the citizen, the bearer of rights. Um, and the owner of property, crucially, even if the only property you own is yourself, because Germany at this time was still kind of uh, not long out of feudalism. And remember, at this time, feudalism was still firmly intact in Tsarist Russia. Uh, where the emancipation of the serfs didn't take place until the 1860s. So the second part of uh, Zu Judenfrage is a critique of the capacity of, of the present day Jews and Christians to become free, which was also published by Bauer. So let's take the bull by the horns and read a big load of text. Um, uh, I, I've truncated it. This has been truncated somewhat for me, actually, uh, but it, but it's it's cut cut it back a bit. Um, but I just want to read it out because let's let's really get to grips with with what he's actually saying. Let us consider the actual worldly Jew, not the Sabbath Jew as Bauer does, but the everyday Jew. Let us not. This is the crucial line. Let us not look for the secret of the Jew in his religion, but let us look for the secret of his religion in the real Jew. What is the secular basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly God? Money. An organization of society which would abolish the preconditions for huckstering and therefore the possibility of huckstering would make the Jew impossible. The Jew has emancipated himself in a Jewish manner, not only because he has acquired financial power, but also because through him, and also apart from him, money has become a world power, and the practical Jewish spirit has become the practical spirit of the Christian nations. The Jews have emancipated themselves insofar as the Christians have become Jews. Money is the jealous God of Israel, in the face of which no other God may exist. Money degrades all the gods of man and turns them into commodities. The bill of exchange is the real God of, Jew, of the Jew. His God is only an illusory bill of exchange. The chimerical nationality of the Jew is the nationality of the merchant, of the man of money in general. So 
why would Marx associate money and God and uh, Judaism and exchange in this way? Um, what Marx is doing is actually drawing upon his knowledge of Jewish history and his understanding of the way Judaism played a particular role in society to say that um, it is not enough to say in order to give up, uh, in order to become emancipated, you have to give up your religion. You have to, what the real emancipation comes from um, giving up the conditions under which one has religion at all. And remember the other thing that was being published in the German French yearbook, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, uh, so um, this is the bit that's often interpreted as being um, anti Semitic, because he's saying all, it looks as if he's saying all Jews are, are, are money grubbers or whatever else. But what he's pointing out is that, that monotheism, uh, that uh, Judaism comes into being at a particular time in history and plays a particular role in history. Um, just to put it into context of Marx's general understanding of religion, uh, here's one of those other famous things that was in uh, that particular yearbook. Um, and it's a contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Uh, famously, religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sire of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of, a, of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. The criticism of religion is, therefore, in embryo, the criticism of that veil of tears in which religion, for which religion is the halo. So here we see a, a reflection of, of what Bauer is also arguing, but Marx is, in a sense, doing it a lot better. He's pointing out that it's not... Um, Judaism that gives rise to capitalism, but capitalism that gives rise to Judaism. It's that veil of tears, uh, the, the, the suffering of living in a class society that gives rise to religion in general, um, which um, it, it provides this um, soul of, a, of soulless conditions. Uh, uh, the, the idea of being the opium of the people is often confused with, with modern day uh, narcotics uh, addiction but it's actually you know you could buy opium over the counter in those days and you took it just to help you get through a miserable life so Marx is being critical of religion not from the point of view of being hostile to religion he's being uh, he's, he's trying to place religion in the context of, of his materialist understanding of Hegel the idealist philosopher um, for, 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 for Hegel, it's the ideas of the world, as it were, that are the important transforming, transformative thing. But here for Marx, it's the material basis of society uh, which uh, gives rise to its expression in, in a religious form. Um, there's the one or two other bits and pieces that are mildly embarrassing with, when, you read, when, when you read Marx's work. Um, uh, through modern eyes, as it were. This is Ferdinand Vassal, who some of you will have met uh, when we did the um, session on on party building, on the on the series on party building. Um, Ferdinand Vassal was actually born Ferdinand Lassal in Breslau, uh, Silesia, um, now Wrocław in Poland. He was the son of Heyman Lassal, um, a Jewish silk merchant. Uh, he himself was was a lawyer, and they were, became friends in 1848 because they were both uh, militants in the revolutions of 1848. Um, there's a reference uh, in a letter to Engels uh, from Marx uh, on the 30th of July, 1862, in which he refers to uh, Ferdinand Lassalle as a Jewish nigger. Um, and again... Uh, you don't have to look too far for learned essays on that Marx was not only an anti-Semite, but he was also a racist. Um, let's put a few things into context. Um, Ferdinand Lassalle um, 
was a, a, a flamboyant and interesting character. In the letter in question, he'd been to stay with Marx in 1861. Uh, and uh, most, of the, most of the letter is actually made up of, of Marx complaining about being skint. Um, and, and that LaSalle uh, would rather go and spend his money on speculative ventures rather than help Marx out, which was um, one thing. Um, LaSalle himself was a strangely contradictory character as a person who was a, helped to found the first um, German Socialist Party, the Social Democratic Workers' Party. He, um, it, it, he was a, a lawyer uh, and pursued the interests of Countess Sophie von Hatzfeld uh, for about eight years in different courts throughout Europe. And she was extremely grateful to him. Uh, and gave him a pension for life, effectively, because she then won her case and came into a huge amount of money. And she effectively was able to inherit her estate, uh, and without that, without Ferdinand Lassalle's help, uh, she wouldn't have been able to do that. I say Ferdinand Lassalle was, as a socialist, a very contradictory figure, a person who was in contact with Otto von Bismarck, um, uh, and who... It, it, he, he got on with Bismarck. He, he, you know, Lasalle regarded himself as a patriotic German, uh, and he wasn't even opposed uh, to the to the Kaiser either. He just wanted there to be, as it were, a, a, a kind of constitutional monarchy, rather like Britain. Um, so the friendship with Marx was rather strained. Um, Engels was was rather less uh, uh, fond of Lasalle, and uh, was often. Uh, much more guarded about him and very suspicious of his contacts with, with Bismarck. Um, if, if you read his letter and the references to him being a Jewish nigger, um, you have to understand that at the time, the term Jewish nigger was, what, nigger at all, wasn't a, 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 a racial slur. Um, Marx and Engels regularly wrote to one another uh, on an almost daily basis. Uh, and um, because they, they were both polyglot they, they both regularly wrote well they, most of their letters were German in German but they regularly put in other little bits of different language so um Marx routinely when he wrote to Engels uh, addressed him as dear Fred in English at the, the top line uh, was dear Fred and then off he goes in German and at various other points they'll put in bits of French or Italian or whatever else um Marx's little kind of a nickname, as it were, that he was known in an affectionate way uh, to the Engels would often write back would, was dear Moore, um, Moore, uh, because of Marx's own swarthy complexion. Um, and so uh, the, the use of the term nigger was quite widespread uh, and didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily regarded as pejorative. Of course, it was much more pejorative in the United States and became more pejorative in, in the rest of the English speaking world later on. Um, but even up until 1955, if anybody remembers the classic war film, The Dam Busters, uh, Wing Commander Guy Gibson's uh, Black Labrador is, is called Nigger. Uh, un quite unselfconsciously, and in the when the film was made in 1955, no one thought anything of it. And this is 1955. Um, but now, if you ever see the film again, it's usually overdubbed, and the dog is called Digger. Um, but that wasn't the case when it was produced. So the term uh, wasn't regarded as uh, as pejorative, and uh, it was often used in English in the letters between Marx and Engels. Um, at one point, uh, at various points, I think, uh, Marx also talks about his daughter, Laura, having married, um, uh, having married a nigger who was, in fact, uh, uh, who, who, because he, 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 he was his, his grandfather, uh, Paul Lafargue. Uh, Laura was married to Paul Lafargue, and Paul Lafargue's uh, uh, grandmother uh, was, uh, was of African um, origin. Um, so uh, the, the term wasn't being used in a way which was 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 which was regarded as a racial slur at the time, and uh, as I say, uh, Marx himself was often referred to by Engels as Moor. Um, um, now I want to put all of that into the proper context, and I'm going to do it by this superb book called *The Jewish Question: uh, A Marxist Interpretation* by Abraham Leon. Abraham Leon was born as Abraham Weinstock in uh, Warsaw, 
Uh, he was a Belgian Trotskyist who was subsequently tortured uh, and murdered in Auschwitz. And it's a history of the Jewish people. Um, what Abraham Leon is arguing is that the Jews in the ancient world and subsequently in the early medieval world constituted a people class. Um, in, in, in the ancient world, uh, initially the spread of uh, Judaism uh, was in the Hellenized part of the uh, of the ancient world. Um, so after the conquest of much of the known world by Alexander the Great, its cities were established and trade was a, was a feature around uh, the Mediterranean in particular, but throughout the Hellenized world. Um, the people class is a reference to the fact that um, the Jews constituted a, 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 a trading nation, as it were, rather like the Phoenicians. Um, they were a, a, a nation, uh, they were a, a, a people class that occupied a particular position within society. In, in the um, ancient world, um, they were crucial in, for example, the trade between East and West, which would, of course, go through the Levant. So uh, the, at one point, the uh, Jewish population of Alexandria was considerably bigger uh, than Jerusalem. Uh, the, even before the destruction of the the, 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 the destruction of the temple, uh, the, the second temple uh, in Jerusalem in in seventy CE AD, uh, the, the Common Era, um, even before the destruction of the temple in seventy CE, there were more Jews living outside the Levant uh, than than in. Uh, the diaspora was already a feature uh, long before um, uh, the destruction of the temple and uh, and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Another thing, uh, which of course is, uh, we tend to think of it as, as, as something innovative by Shlomo Sand and the invention of the Jewish people, but actually Abraham Leon got there a lot earlier. Uh, in the Jewish question, he talks about the way in which the Romans didn't expel the entire population of the Levant, of you know, Canaan, Judea, Samaria. They didn't e expel all the, the people of the land. Uh, they might well have rounded up what they would have thought of as the ringleaders of Jewish rebellions uh, and carted them off to cha in chains to Rome to be, be slaves or, or, or eaten by wild animals in the Colosseum. Um, but they didn't remove people from the land far from it who else was going to feed the roman legionnaires who else was going to provide the social surplus to be extracted from judea samaria canaan um so um very far from being displaced from the from the from the land um the same people remained there and arguably the people currently living in palestine are the direct descendants of those very people but of course um over time, uh, they had converted to Islam. So uh, effectively, um, trade became what the Jewish people did in the ancient world. Uh, they constituted a, a, a very important part of uh, the ancient world. Um, remember, whilst Christianity was a uh, religion of uh, the poor and dispossessed, um, and was illegal, uh, Judaism wasn't. And Judaism played an important part in Roman society uh, throughout what had been the Hellenized world um, as, as providing a, a very important uh, trading caste in, in, in the context of the ancient world. Um, and later on, in the early part of uh, the medieval period, uh, also constituted a, 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 a caste within medieval society, uh, providing um, banking and finance uh, and, uh, and 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 trade. Um, these pictures, if, if anybody knows Lincoln, uh, the one uh, you can see here with the the nice Romanesque windows uh, that hasn't been knocked about too much, um, is just simply called the Jew's House. It is now a, a restaurant, uh, and before that, it was an antique shop. Um, you can see it's it's on a, a road called, unsurprisingly, Steep Hill, and uh, this is Jews Court. Um, unfortunately, the windows have been ruined and uh, new stuff has been put in in the 19th and 20th century. Um, 
but this was clearly a very substantial building for the medieval period, uh, probably built in about 1870. And um, archaeologically, I understand uh, the synagogue sat really just behind uh, Jews' court uh, and the Jews' house. So having been responsible for trade uh, in, in the ancient world, rather like the Phoenicians had before um, throughout the Levant, um, by the time you get to the First Crusade in 1886, uh, sorry, 1096 to 1099, um, you already have a situation where the, the kind of um, the mercantile role of the Jews in, the, in, in, in medieval society was being taken over increasingly by Christians. And so uh, what we see in the First Crusade is... Um, that there was the competition for uh, the lucrative uh, trade that went through the Levant, uh, this important trade between East and West, which had previously been the, 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 the province of the Jews, um, was now coveted and seized uh, by, by, by Christian kings. And the First Crusade uh, established a series of, uh, of uh, Crusader states to dominate the uh, trade route through the Levant uh, in the period after 1099. It's interesting to note as well um, that in uh, 1093, uh, sorry, 1096, um, that the uh, First Crusade was also uh, accompanied by the butchery of, uh, of hundreds of thousands of Jews throughout Europe uh, as uh, peasants were uh, attacked uh, um, uh, Jewish homes and, 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 and sacked them. Um, so you can see that this was a substantial uh, building, uh, probably built in 1170. By 1290, um, all the Jews in England had either been uh, forced to leave or killed or forced to convert to Christianity, um, a, a process which took place in the, in the 13th century in France, in the 14th century in Germany, and of course the 15th century in Spain. Um, what you see, for example, in Al-Andalus, uh, the caliphate in Spain and Portugal uh, was that the Jews constituted a kind of equal partner with the uh, with the Moors, uh, the Muslims in, in the context of uh, of the Iberian Peninsula, and um, and although, for example, um, Jews would have been taxed at maybe a differential rate, for example, to compared to Muslims, um, the point was that the Muslims did. Uh, the the Jews played that particular role of 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 trade and banking uh, in the context of of medieval Europe. For a long time, up until uh, twelve ninety, um, Jews first came uh, to Britain in uh, uh, ten sixty six um, with William the Conqueror as again bankers, merchants, um, uh, and traders, and. Uh, were, were protected explicitly by the by the king, uh, because the, the, the Jews constituted a, a valuable source of revenue for the crown. Uh, where they would extract uh, uh, higher taxes uh, from from the, from Jewish merchants, and the term merchant became almost synonymous with with Jew under this con in this context. So um, the, the level of development of the market now remember here we're not here talking about capitalism in the modern sense but of a, of a of mercantile trade and production of goods for the market as opposed to a natural economy where uh, things were produced simply to uh, satisfy one's own personal needs and one just simply sells uh, the, the small surplus um in the market instead all production goes over to the market so one of the things that you see in England for example is the development of the wool trade as a world commodity um, and, the, and it's that wool trade that was uh, so highly lucrative um, what easier way can there be to get rid of one's creditors than simply kill them in the context of, of England um, you know uh, feud, there wasn't really a conflict between feudal lords peasants and the Jews uh, up until uh, 1290. Um, there had been pogroms before that in uh, Lincoln uh, in uh, 1195, I think. Um, but uh, 
it, it, there was no conflict because you know feudal lords did what feudal lords did they exploited peasants peasants did what peasants did they scratched about in the soil and grew crops uh, and gave over part of their produce to the lord or gave over uh, compulsory labor to the lord um there was no conflict between either of those castes as it were uh, and and the Jews who occupied a particular stratum in 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 the, in the, in the early medieval part of history, um, and so um, this development of trade and of production for the market uh, was more advanced, for example, in England than it was in France and in Germany and in Spain, and so the expulsion of the Jews follows the development of the market in these various areas. Um, so. The importance of this is that this, if one listens to uh, Zionists or whatever else uh, talking about the, the place of Jews in society, that they've always somehow been hated by Christians and they, there's always been a, a, a deep antipathy between Jew and Muslim, Jew and Christian, it certainly isn't true in history. Uh, you see in Al-Andalus, for example, a flourishing of Jewish uh, history and art and literature and science, along with Muslim art and literature and science. They were, as it were, uh, partners in the project, as indeed they were, as the Jews were in medieval Europe in the early part of the feudal period. Um, so Jews were concerned with the development of, of mer mercantile capital uh, and, and, put bluntly, usury, uh, lending money at interest. So by 1290, uh, all uh, Jews were expelled from England and not really readmitted until the uh, until uh, Cromwell's Commonwealth, um, the oldest um, continuously used synagogue uh, in England at the moment is Beavis Marks, uh, which was opened in 1707. Um, and Beavis Marks was a, a Sephardic uh, synagogue. Uh, the first wave of, uh, of Jews allowed back into England tended to be Sephardic Jews, so Jews from uh, Spain and Portugal and to a certain extent from North Africa. Um, what happened to the rest of the Jews, um, what we see is a, a, an eastward move uh, into more where, where feudalism remained intact. Um, an interesting feature about uh, Judaism throughout the early medieval period was that it was also a proselytizing religion. And after all, in the in the in the ancient world, it, as far as monotheism was concerned, it was the only game in town. Uh, and so we see, for example, uh, sometimes the ruling class of a particular society would convert to Judaism. Uh, because of its relationship to trade. Uh, so. Um, uh, Khazaria, uh, the area around the Caspian Sea, which was uh, a, a Jewish kingdom, as it were, um, was an area which was um, where the where the ruling class had converted to Judaism, and, Ju and conversion to Judaism was widespread throughout the Hellenistic world, throughout the ancient world, and to a certain extent uh, throughout the early medieval part of, the, of, of history. However, as the growth of the market meant that increasingly production is for exchange of world commodities on a world market. Um, the Jews are effectively forced eastwards into the, into the pores of Polish society, into the pores of those uh, parts of uh, the, the world that are still basically feudal. Um, and, and, and it's only then that you start to get the growth of what we might call modern anti-Semitism. So whilst Jews had gone through periods where they'd uh, been usurped, uh, had their property stolen uh, by feudal lords. We're not talking about anti-Semitism in the modern sense. Um, we're talking, you know, and we'll come on to that now. So, um, as Abraham Leon puts it, uh, the Jewish masses find themselves wedged between uh, the anvil of decaying feudalism and the hammer of rotting capitalism. Um, uh, <clears throat> So the, even before uh, the division of uh, Poland between the Soviet Union and Germany, um, there was widespread anti uh, and I was supposed to say anti-Semitism in Poland even before World War II. Um, and Zionism, of course, was a particular response to anti-Semitism. Um, in the early, whilst um, uh, it, 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 the 
the, the role of the Jews uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a trading nation in the context of, uh, of, of Western Europe uh, declined um, and it, it thrived for, for a period in Eastern Europe. Um, and what Abraham Leon argues is that uh, as the market encroached increasingly into Eastern Europe, uh, the Jews started to be forced out of it, even that position there. And so instead of being um, well-respected uh, traders and merchants and bankers, instead they were forced often into the kind of petty huckstering of uh, pawnbroking or petty trade or or, or of or, or, or selling small goods or and, and petty usury. Uh, and from that point of view, it's then that they become uh, in conflict with um, Polish uh, and, and other um, farmers, peasants, and so on. Uh, and from that, and from that point of view, modern anti-Zion and anti-Semitism uh, starts to become a, a feature of Poland well before, uh, long before uh, World War Two. Um, so the Zionism itself in nineteenth century in, in the, is a nineteenth century response to anti-Semitism. Theodor Herzl wrote the Jewish State in eighteen ninety six. Most East European Jews uh, in the early part of the, uh, the in the 19th century, and early part of the 20th century, were either members of the Bund, uh, the Social Democratic J Jewish Workers Bund, or were members of uh, uh, socialist or communist parties. And that fascism, um, we've seen um, quite a, a, a bit of debate about. Uh, Israel, for example, being called fascist by a number of people. Uh, as I, I've made a point on more than one occasion, I think fascism, the term fascism, is best reserved for that particular period in the 1920s and 30s when there was a particular concatenation of events where you had the potential for a revolutionary proletariat which could take power, uh, uh, a petty bourgeoisie, whether it's Polish or, or German, uh, that was often maybe in debt to... Uh, uh, Jewish lenders, uh, and on the other hand, uh, a haute bourgeoisie. So the petty bourgeoisie were crushed, as it were, between big capital uh, on the one hand and a potentially revolutionary proletariat on the other. And from that point of view, uh, the anti-Semitism of, uh, of Eastern Europe uh, th throughout the Russian Empire um, was a feature of the particular position into which the Jews had been pushed um, as a direct consequence of losing their place, which they'd previously enjoyed in the context of uh, uh, early medieval period and uh, subsubsequently um, it, it throughout the, throughout Western Europe. Um, so just to conclude then, as we saw, um, most Jews were outside of, uh, were, were part of the diaspora long before um, uh, long before the, 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 the sacking of the Second Temple in 70 AD um, and uh, had, had been effectively been forced eastwards and were a proselytizing religion on the way. Um, very few Jews at all were Zionist before uh, 1945, and even those that were, um, very few actually emigrated to, uh, it, to Palestine. Uh, insofar as uh, Jews emigrated at all, and they did so in very large numbers, they tended to emigrate, first of all, from the countryside into the cities. And so the, the Jewish population became an urban population. And moreover, where they did emigrate outside of, for example, Poland, the preferred destination was the United States, Britain, Canada, and almost anywhere uh, but Palestine. Um, only a few religious Jews uh, were emigrating to Palestine in the period after the First World War. Uh, and uh, that particular uh, series of events is something that we'll address in further uh, sessions in this series. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, could you stop sharing screen, please, comrade? Thank you so much. That was really a whirlwind through all of history there of uh, how the Jewish uh, people developed. That was really interesting. Comrades, if you want to get involved in asking or ask a question, make a contribution, remember there are no stupid questions, no wrong questions, and we are all here to learn. Um, and I'm going to ask a stupid one now straight away. 
Um, so the 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 development, I mean, you touched on it, obviously, the, you know, Marx, Marx and uh, Engels as well, but Marx in particular in his in his essay, that was, you say, you know, language obviously changes all the time. So this is a reflection of language changing. It is the missing context, et cetera. So throughout, you know, whenever since ever since Marx um, died and was become became a tool <laughs> as well, used by the left, but also used by by the right, it's come up and down, isn't it? This this quite this this uh, this this accusation that he is actually anti-Semitic. Have you seen have you seen this um, being um, you know re um, visited through in this period where? Corbyn, you know, the whole left, Corbyn, they are all anti-Semites. Have you seen this um, charge? There's been quite a few articles written about how Marx was 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 both racist and anti-Semitic. Mm. Um, racist is an interesting accusation. Uh, it almost entirely uh, is based upon Marx using the term nigger um, it, at a time when lots of people did and it wasn't meant as a racial slur. Um, Certainly, there have been quite a few articles written about Marx as an anti-Semite, um, which is absolutely absurd. Uh, uh, I mean, just consider this. I mean, Eleanor Marx, who, who his, his daughter, um, uh, actually embraced her father's um, Jewish heritage uh, and, and learned Yiddish so she could work among the, uh, a lot of workers in East London were particularly women uh, were working in uh, the textile industry in sweated trades uh, and spoke Yiddish. And uh, Eleanor Marx, who'd never spoken a word of Yiddish, taught herself Yiddish. I mean, she was an extraordinarily capable woman. She taught herself Norwegian just so she could read the works of Henrik Ibsen um, and taught herself Yiddish so that she could uh, help organize uh, Jewish workers in sweated trades in East London. There was no sense of any kind of hostility to Judaism as such. It was an understanding of, uh, of the, why the people, why, why the Jewish people were taken up, the, were in the position in society that they were. I mean, once you understand that, uh, all sorts of other things become intelligible. I mean, if you go and watch, um, the Merchant of Venice by by William Shakespeare. I mean, it's interesting that he calls it. It's the Merchant of Venice. It's not the Merchant of of, of East London, uh, because there were no Jews. Shakespeare would, would never have met a Jewish person, uh, and neither would anyone in his audience, because they'd all been killed or, or thrown it or forced out out of the country. But Judaism, in this context, in the context of the Merchant of Venice, was a, was another way of referring to capitalism, and it's in that context that really. Marx is talking about Judaism. Of uh, you know, now, this is not to uh, say that Marx is in any way suggesting that the Jews are responsible for capitalism. That is a slur which is put forward by uh, Werner Sombart, uh, among others, um, who, who tried to argue. I mean, Werner Sombart had been a socialist and moved over to being a fascist uh, by the nineteen uh, late nineteen thirties, uh, and tried to argue that the, the Jews were, as it were, responsible for capitalism. Um, uh, he was an associate also of um, Max Weber, uh, who, who also tried to uh, uh, assign um, to religion, um, uh, but but in his case of, of Protestantism, to, to, of bringing capitalism into being. Um, and of course, uh, for Marx, it's it's the other way around. It's the the, the, the economic conditions that throw up the, the the form taken by religion. So the form. It, it's interesting to speculate on why monotheism grows up when it does uh, in terms of the development of world markets. Um, uh, I read one historian also of the Quran, whose name escapes me at the moment, but, but makes a similar point that um, um, Islam uh, was also concerned with the question around trade. And monotheism, of course, is it, it, once you're dealing with the market, you're dealing with an a universal. Everybody's labour becomes commensurable with everybody else's labour. Uh, um, perhaps all, ultimately it all becomes commensurable with gold or silver, which can take the form of money. Um, really, uh, monotheism represents a, a, a universalism that becomes a, a feature of, 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 of bourgeois society. Um, but even before capitalism, 
uh, is associated with trade. But there are certainly people out there writing really relatively recent rubbish about how Marx was a raging anti-Semite, and therefore uh, you, it's what you'd expect of the left. And of course, is it? What also makes it difficult is the fact that we know there was widespread anti-Semitism in the former Soviet Union. Um, so the famous doctor's plot, for example, shortly before the death of Stalin, um, was, a, was an implication that um, rootless cosmopolitans who, who didn't really owe their allegiance to the Soviet Union or to Russia um, were behind um, a, a attempts to, to uh, poison Stalin and so on. I've um, read something very briefly about, um, you know, apparently it's not quite, um, it's it's controversial why J Jewish people or the Jewish people class were <clears throat> in that position that they, you know, ended up in finance, et cetera, traders quite so much. I mean, the 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 usual, and you, you touched on that, obviously, the usual thing, you know, in the medieval times in particular, Jews were not allowed to own land um they were not allowed to do the guilds join the guild so they were pushed into financing they were the only um people really who could do financing and then they became good at it this is now sort of by some historians jewish historians ever zionist uh, pro zionist uh, historians been been questioned i you know that it's not it's not then capitalism that turns sort of turns around and makes that into something quite useful etc but it's actually jewish people um um sort of worked really hard and they they just applied themselves and they spent more time on educating themselves and were good with 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 figures etc and that's why what's that's why they've become such a such a leading um force within banking and and finance etc it's got nothing to do with the sort of previous history um well i think there's probably a bit of bit of both going on but where where do you see how it's it's still relevant you know how it's still there are a relatively a lot of jewish people still in finance and in in banking etc um abraham leon addresses this uh, quite explicitly um, what he also points out, for example, is that um, Christians were often simply not allowed to go into banking, um, not because, uh, well, simply because, you know, in, in, a, in a feudal society, you, you, you stuck to your, uh, your, your stratum, as it were. So if you wanted to go into banking, you would be expected to be Jewish. Um, um, and, and yes, uh, Jews were prevented from from going into the the guilds, for example. But so were, for example, uh, people who were declassé Christians, you know, impoverished Christians, or, or Christians from um, some other background, or, or foreigners, or whatever else, would also be prevented from going into the guilds. And um, uh, from that point of view, uh, it, it was part of the stratification of the ancient world more than. Um, uh, a kind of, uh, the, you know, the, the typical story is that um, uh, the Jews were forced to take up usury uh, because uh, it was a, a sin for, for Christians to engage in usury. Um, in fact, what uh, Leon is arguing is that usury was a was a was a feature of trade. If you're if you're engaged in in trade, then you're lending money, and of course that's exactly what we see in the Merchant of Venice, isn't it? You know, so. The uh, Christian trader is lent money by Shylock, and he whimsically suggests that his interest will be a pound of flesh taken from uh, the, the merchant's heart if he doesn't pay up on time. And of course, he's going to pay up on time because he's a man of his honour, and so on and so forth. But then the ship is then the ships are wrecked in a storm, uh, and, and Shylock will have his pound of flesh. Uh, what Marx is talking, what uh, Shakespeare is talking about, is the rapacity of capitalism, not the rapaciousness of Jews. And um, oh, and by the way, <laughs> Abraham Lee is not saying that all Jews were rich either. Uh, oh, merely that uh, it, Jews were con connected with trade one way or another, and that connection with trade might well be as stevedores, uh, as, uh, uh, as 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 uh, as t tailors or whatever else that were uh, often at themselves at the margins. Do you see similarities? Because listening to yourself. Sort of popped into my head into my head that you know the same way that Christianity you know as a sort of what what started as a 
rebellion, you know, a, a religion of rebellion and was put down by the ruling class and was, you know, uh, stop, tried to stop it. And they, you know, killed Jew, Jesus, whoever he was or whichever people they he was, rebellions, you know, uh, running, um, uh, starting up everywhere, etc. And then they took it over. And then they actually noticed that actually we, the ruling class, we can use this, we can use it, make it our own, turn it on its head, etc. Something similar seems to have gone on there. You know, you push Jews to the side, etc. And then there's a recognition actually for the development of capitalism. This is useful. We can make this our own, and we can, you know, we we can take this over to to a degree. And uh, perhaps that that explains a, f a few things. Yes, by, by the time of Constantine, um, Christianity was no longer really the the, relig the religion of the, the poor and dispossessed, but had become a, an expression of that same um, universalism that was trade. Uh, um, and, and from that point of view, the, uh, that constitutes a period when, when there was a, a competition between Judaism and Christianity. Of course, you can even see elements of, I mean, it's it's an argument. I, I'm not a, a theologian. I don't know a great deal about it. But if you compare, for example, uh, the Synoptic Gospels, the first three Gospels are quite different to, to the Gospel of St. John. And one argument is that this later Gospel was an, it was an effort to distance Christians from uh, the rebelliousness of Jews in the Levant, uh, from that point of view, to help pave the way for an acceptance of Christianity within the Roman Empire. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Ian, yeah, yeah, Ian. Yes, you are, Ian. There's another oh, Ian in the audience. Yeah. I'm confused. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, comrades, if you have a question or want to make a contribution, please click raise hand. We've got Tony first. Yeah. Hi, Tony. Yeah, hi, Tina. Hi, Ian. Uh, thank you very much for an extremely comprehensive talk, uh, really covering a vast expanse of history all in one hour. It's uh, in many ways quite amazing so really i've just got a few short things the first thing is i was surprised you actually didn't mention moses hess who was a fellow of marx and who is alleged to have inspired on the jewish question uh i'd be interested for your comments on that uh i mean there have been whole books written i mean this one in particular i don't really read it jewish Karbach, Karbach. He's a Sussex, he was, he's dead now, Sussex University historian, the radical critique, uh, Karl Marx and the radical critique of Judaism, where a whole book is written on why Marx is anti-Semitic based on this one essay. I mean, it has, it, it has been exploited mercilessly, including, of course, the use of language taken totally out of context. And I, I think that's the point that needs to be made, that, I mean, things like, to Jew, for example, was a quite common expression a uh, hundred years ago. It wasn't particularly, it wasn't anti-Semitic. There's in Brighton now, we have a Jew street still. I mean, it, it, this was extremely common, but of course, if, if you take something out of its historical context and you can make virtually anybody uh, anti-Semitic. And, and Leon, uh, he summed up this really in his, in his book, and it is a classic, and I think people really should read it, when he said Zionism transposes modern anti-Semitism to all of history and saves itself the trouble of studying the various forms of anti-Semitism and their evolution. Uh, and that's the point. For Zionism, anti-Semitism is an ahistorical phenomena. Uh, it's always been there, always will be there, and ultimately it's because of the Jew themselves. I mean, why else would anti-Semitism exist? There must be something about a Jew which produces anti-Semitism wherever he or she goes. Uh, and this is the bankrupt logic of Zionism, which we're now seeing uh, playing out in Gaza, to be quite honest, because it does have quite lethal consequences, this idea that we're always a victim. Uh, the Holocaust was just one stage in the very long running play. Uh, and you see, for example, I mean, uh, the demonization of the Palestinians and Muslims, there, because I mean, Zionism is an important uh, part of Islamophobia. And I mean, it does need to be emphasized. And 
uh, re-emphasized in many ways that when Christian anti-Semitism, feuds of anti-Semitism occurred in Europe, Jews also fled to North Africa. Moses Maimonides, the most famous uh, religious philosopher, uh, he fled, he became Saladin's uh, personal physician, for example. Uh, and as you said, uh, the Palestinians themselves, if anyone is the direct descendant of the ancient Hebrews, it's not the European settlers who came in, it's the Palestinians themselves. And there's a lot of evidence in terms of rituals and so on, like lighting candles on a Friday night and so on, to suggest the Palestinians do have that direct lineage before they converted first to Christianity. Uh, and then to Muslim, but Muslims. But I think the main thing, I mean, Marx's essay was a, a brilliant prefiguring uh, of Abraham Leon in a sense, because he seized on the essential. He, the religion survived because of the Jews. The Jews didn't survive because uh, of uh, their religion, which is what, of course, the rabbis and religious philosophers say. But I think the most important differentiation we can make between modern anti-Semitism and feudal or ancient anti-Semitism is in the past we, when you had a peasant rebellion because of, they wanted to burn the creditor notes and so on, Jews had issued. This was an anti-Semitism from below, whereas modern anti-Semitism, whether it was from the Tsarist regime or Hitler, the Nazis, it came from above and it was a conscious attempt uh, to divide and rule amongst other things and it ended up of course in the Holocaust but today we see how that has been exploited uh, in order to perpetuate further genocide thank you yes, I, I was fascinated about the, uh, the the various promissory notes for example that existed uh, so if you had a Jewish money lender in, in early medieval England in particular um, the promissory notes would be stored in a particular place and the peasants would, of course, want to seize hold of that and burn the promissory notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and of course, in in so doing, many many Jews were killed. Um, one of the interesting things about the kings of England, they looked after themselves <laughs> because quite often, even if they they, they uh, seized the promissory notes, even though the, the the creditor was killed, the king said, "Well, because the Jews are effectively the property of the crown." <laughs> you've got to pay the crown what you would have been paying the Jews. <laughs> so, yeah. um, the, the Jewish population was, was um, as far as the kings of England were concerned, and the kings of France and indeed um, the, the various kind of kingdoms within Germany, were, were pe pe people to be shaken down every now and then and, 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 and taxed in a particular way. Um, and it was that was the that was the price that the Jewish people had to pay for, for, to be able to operate that business. Um, on the question of Moses Hess, I, I don't know a vast amount about him. I know, do know, of course, he was a an early associate of Marx and Engels, uh, and uh, was, but of course, was a kind of socialist Zionist, uh, which of course Marx and Engels could have no no truck with whatsoever. Um, there was also the in Jerusalem, which was the first Zionist pamphlet, in fact. Mm. Uh, yeah. Oh, go on, tell me a bit more about that. That's interesting. It, it was in 1861 he wrote it. I mean, it, he wasn't a socialist by then because he said uh, quite clearly that uh, race is primary, class is secondary. But he prefigured Theodore Herzl by over 30 years. Uh, he had become, uh, but he, he was a Zionist without a Zionist movement. I mean, that's the point. That's why he made virtually no impact on history, uh, whereas Herzl gathered round him a movement. So that was why it was different. It was before his time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, as I understand it, Zionism of, of Herzl was really a kind of response to the kind of intensifying pogroms that were taking place within um, the Russian Empire and so on. Um, uh, of course, uh, you, you also notice a difference in uh, the, uh, the the Jewish population of England uh, changed, of course, as well, because uh, the, the early part, the, the early after the, um, the the Commonwealth allowed Jews back in, uh, were, were mostly Sephardic and and actually generally better off. And of course, Benjamin de Israeli um, was uh, derived was, was 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 one of those. But of course, he converted to. Uh, the Church of England by then, and uh, so he could assume his, his political role. Um, later Jews, uh, towards the end of the, the, the 19th century uh, and early 20th century, tended to be um, Ashkenazim, 
and and we're invariably poorer. And so what you got in East London, for example, was a a, a very a, a Yiddish culture which had its own theatres, its own newspapers. And it, I could, in a sense, I just caught the tail end of that when I was living in East London. Um, uh, you know, you you would meet people who could still speak Yiddish who, and so on. But but in, well, what seems to have happened is where, for, for example, um, British Jews have assimilated and become proletarians, they stopped being Jewish. Uh, where where they'd stayed in business or whatever else, then um, they they moved they moved out to Gold's Green or um, Hackney or whatever else. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Um, uh, Felicity, please. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Ian. That was very interesting. And a little aside, I have um, my, uh, one of my uncles, a great uncle, was a genealogist, lived in the United States, emigrated there, I think his parents at the beginning of the century, of last century. And um, he wrote a history of a thousand years of my father's family in Europe. So I have a history of a thousand years of so so you're really accurate. I mean that that is very accurate accurate. Um and also the the pogroms, I think we mustn't forget things like the the po pogroms of Russia and what have you, but also my father's family also came from I mean not they were Ashkenazi and for example I have 100 percent European genetics. Um, so a lot of Ashkenazi Jews and maybe other Jews, you know, the Sephardic, actually don't have any Middle Eastern genetic heritage, which is an, an irony because they say it's their natural home. But I think it's something like 2% of, um, and also I had a relative of my mother, well, my mother married a number of times, but I had a relative of my mother whose father was the doctor at the court of Egypt, who was Jewish, Palestinian, and said Jew and Arab live very happily together um, in harmony. Of course, the ratios were different, uh, I think, in the 20s or the 30s or something like that, oh, no earlier than that. Um, but also, my father's family were intellectuals from Kiev, what is now Kiev, uh, no, sorry, not Kiev, Lvov which is now Lviv in Ukraine. So there was, you. I don't think you can say there was a homogenous, that the Jewish, the Jews in Europe were this homogenous. I know you had kind of shtetl Jews and they had, they were the Jews who had Yiddish and they had the theatres and so on and so forth. But I think you can't say that the, um, that, uh, they were they they were a homogenous group. They were very different. I mean, I I don't know what Tony thinks, but uh, anyway, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. A little aside. Oh, and uh, and thank you. I thought. Oh, and also Marx. I think that Marx wasn't talking necessarily about. I think for for Marx, my understanding of his writings is that he saw any religion as something deflecting keeping people down and keeping people usurping power from people so that's how I read it I don't read it that he was how can he be anti-semitic it's like you know he was a Jew it's I just hate that that whole thing of Jew, you're a self-hating Jew it's bizarre I mean I support the Palestinians so I know Zionists would call me a self-hating Jew they'd call Tony a self-hating Jew they'd call anybody else who's Jewish and has a different viewpoint that uh, I mean I'm I'm an atheist, but but I still have the extraction. You know, was I in any country where they didn't like Jews or people from Jewish extraction? Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, Marx and Engels were not, certainly not hostile to religion, any religions really. They didn't regard it in kind of functionalist terms. Uh, I think they regarded it as um, uh, it, it's something that would wither away in time rather than being something that needs to be suppressed or or, or even criticised severely. I mean, you don't see a sense of criticism. I mean, it's quite interesting. If you look at photographs of uh, of the Marx daughters, uh, I think one or two of them were wearing crucifixes. Uh, I think it was Laura was wearing a crucifix. And one of those cru they, they, they weren't hostile to religion. And as, and as I say, Eleanor uh, positively embraced 
um, uh, her, her Jewish heritage. Um, and they're also the other, thing, of course, the, the other response, of course, to um, um, uh, uh, from from the eighteenth century uh, was was, a, was, a, was was mysticism. Um, so uh, rather than you know concentrating on the Talmud, the Kabbalah. So you end up with the uh, mystical kind of tradition, and, and and you see that a little bit with um, some Haredi Jews today, uh, and an interest in, in in that side of things. Um, so, and uh, as we've seen, uh, people like uh, uh, many Haredi Jews will, will regard Israel as, as as not only murderous but blasphemous with it. A lot of Marxists think, um, you know, if somebody says they're religious, they have to go and you know throw that's that's stupid don't be stupid and don't don't believe in god it's so clearly not true etc marx and engels had a much more sophisticated approach than that i think they explained it in a material way but they also that famous quote you know it's not just religion is the opium for the people it, it goes on at some length and they're explaining it's also the the heart in a heartless world, the soul and soulless conditions, you know, they explain how, why people turn to religion even, you know, then, but it would still work today, wouldn't it? They have a, it's a very good, it's actually a very good, um, sophisticated and understanding um, approach to religion, which I always thought is amazing. Um, Agnes next. Did it work? Yeah, you're there. Wonderful. Um, and Ian, thank you very much for your very, <clears throat> really very interesting talk. Um, of course, Marx wasn't um, anti-Semitic. Um, in the 19th century, especially in the middle and a little bit later, I think it was pretty fashionable to kind of write so-called anti-Semitic essays and so on. But these people were like armchair philosophers or armchair anti-Semites, but they were not really practicing anti-Semites. And I just like to bring up Wagner, Richard Wagner, because he's the same period and he is supposed to be horrendously anti-Semitic. And I mean, Hitler adopted him and that makes it even worse. But yes, Wagner wrote uh, some pretty horrific things about Jews. On the other hand, I mean, his life work was his compositions, you know, The Ring and Parsifal and those operas. And he entrusted them to Hermann Levy, a Jewish conductor, not anybody else. And it was Hermann Levy who premiered all these works. So th this is really my point that it's a different kind of anti-Semitism, but it's not practical because in practice, as far as I can tell, in practice, Wagner wasn't anti-Semitic. He was just writing a lot of rubbish. Okay, and thank you again, um, Ian, for your very interesting talk. Thanks, thank Agnes. Um, if you read uh, Martin Luther, you find, great, find a lot of anti-Semitism there and all. And it's an interesting one. There's a magnificent um, essay by Friedrich Engels, um, The Peasant War in Germany. Uh, and I always used to recommend this as an antidote to reading um, Max Weber uh, on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. If you really want to understand um, the Reformation, you know, religious ideas in transformation or an expression of a transformation in society, you know, the, the growth of the market in um in germany was an expression of was it was expressed in in a, in, a, in a form which was uh, you know, lutheran protestantism which was anti-semitic uh, and it, it was a, a a reflection of the the, the change in in the economic base of society uh, yeah peter next please Um, thank you. Uh, apologies, first of all, because um, we missed the beginning of your talk, but my question hopefully is a simple one. Um, I just wanted to, if you could clarify um, the relationship between Jews that were trading in, in uh, Moorish Spain 
where they were using they traded through usury uh, while Moors were against the idea of usury. Indeed, uh, and and similarly in in Europe, but I, but I think again it's um, one argument is that uh, the Jews were usurers because the Moors were not allowed to do usury, and that's still a feature of, of Islam today. You can only uh, have a, a certain percentage. Uh, but the other argument, and I think the one that Abraham Leon puts forward, is that yeah. actually it's a ref it's a it's a reflection of the the position of the Jews in society. Uh, you know, the, the the Moors did what feudal lords did. They they exploited peasants. Uh, the Jews had uh, that particular place in 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 Al Andalus in uh, the, the the Caliph in in Iberia. Rather than it being, uh, well, well, we can't do usury, so we'll let you do it. Uh, but they were kind of equal partners, as it were. I know, um, just in the same ways that you had in in early feudal England, uh, the um, the Moors would extract uh, taxes from uh, the Jews in Al Andalus, uh, but it, they were, um, but they weren't being kind of uh, persecuted or they were, they were, or suppressed or. Uh, no religious ideas. If anyone gets the opportunity, the only the, the, there are uh, only three surviving synagogues in Spain. The best one is in Toledo, and you can see it was quite a sumptuous building. Um, they obviously had a very important part to play in Andalusian society, uh, in uh, Al Andalus. So that's all of Spain, right up and up to uh, the, the the very northern bit. Um, uh, name which escapes me uh, where they drink cider <laughs> and um is, uh, yeah so yeah so right up until the, the so-called reconquista and even then uh the, the christian kings initially tolerated the jews for a, for a, for a period for the same kinds of reasons that they were able to shake them down on a reg regular basis and ex extract taxes from them it's not some sort of idea that muslims were uh there is a, a kind of a, a Quranic feature where you know you don't the the, the the early Islam was not interested in in persecuting other people of the book Christians and Jews, uh, but in in fact people who were pagans, uh, polytheists. Um, but the, uh, the the Jews and the Moors in in Spain were, were kind of co partners, as it were. Thank you. Um, Ian? Yeah, just a couple of points. I mean, it's an interesting discussion. I thought the thought was very interesting. I disagree possibly with some of the emphasis on some of it. I mean, I think the, uh, I think, I think, I think that Marx's uh, essay was a precursor of what Leon actually wrote. And I've done a lot of sort of, uh, we've been influenced a lot by Abram Leon in terms of his, in terms of politics and uh, understanding of Zionism and the Jewish question, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think I think it's a mistake to see to this. I think Leon himself explicitly attacked the idea at some point. I can't remember exactly where in his book that the Jews were simply crudely forced into 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 usury and business and 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 you know money making and all this sort of thing by religious persecution and religious prohibitions. I think it's a bit more complex than that. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's about feudal. You know, that, that Christianity was originally. Uh, uh, in, in antiquity, it might have been the religion of the poor, but in, 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 in as, as, as when antiquity was, was effectively overcome, and you saw the, uh, uh, the growth of feudalism, the, the, the church became the centre of feudalism, you know, the church became the, uh, the, the, the core, it, not exactly the core of the ruling class, but certainly a, 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 a very large part of, uh, of what drove feudalism as a system. And, you know, I think the, the the Jews were, were you know, it, it, a phenomena, part of a phenomena that's actually quite com quite common throughout other parts of the world, except it wasn't necessarily Jews who were in that position. You know, you see, you see Chinese people in other parts of Asia, um, in Africa later, you saw you know, Indians, etc., playing a trading role. And I think, that, you know, I think that, you know, the, the, the peoples were traditionally, the Jews were trading people in antiquity. I mean, that is documented. There were others who disappeared you know, Phoenicians or whatever, but the Jews survived. 
And I think that the reason they survive is they were able to get into a particular niche in in in, in the emerging feudal society. Um, and they they were not they were not money lenders to start with. I mean, I'm sure they did money, they did lend money, but the, but their main role was international trade, you know. Um, and uh, the feudal ruling classes were much more local. But the the thing that, that the people who actually uh, were able to you know uh, move things around and, and buy and sell on a, on an international basis were were the Jews because of their prior history uh, as a commercial population. Uh, and, and of course, there's the, the diaspora and the whole emigration thing as well, you know. Um, but uh, it's not simply true that they were simply forced into it by religious pro prohibition into into becoming usurers. You know, I think that's that's a bit of a distort, you know, a bit of a, a reductionist view. I mean, I think Marx Marx's Marx's work is not about race. It's about religion, and it's about the influence of you know the influence of the secular, material world on religion, and 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 the and and, and the way it's uh, um, you know the, the the way that finds reflection in religion. And, and Marx would have been very well aware of the, uh, of, of, the of, of the trading role of the Jews and the ro the roles of you know particularly in the earlier period and the. Uh, uh, and in the later period, when when it's basically it was capitalism, it was the Jews. The Jews were not a capitalist group. They were as a people class. They were not capitalists. They were they embodied commercial capital, not productive capital. Not they don't produce surplus value. They're a trade. You know, it's, it's trade. You buy you buy from one place and sell as a profit in another place. But there's no actual inputs for in terms of production. You know, so it wasn't capitalist production. And when capitalist production came on the scene, it started to drive the, the Jews out of the merchants. Period. And that's when they were forced into usury. You know, that is that is Leon's theory, really. The, the forcing the forcing them into the financial sector was uh, a, a later product of, uh, of, uh, of of their social role as capitalism actually pushed them out. You know, so it's a funny funny sort of uh, uh, paradox, really, that. Uh, um, the Jews became were pushed out of, of their previous pre-capitalist position by the rise of capitalism, and they were persecuted in that last period, in, in the later period of feudalism, and that laid the basis for that, that capitalism, in the sense, that actually, it both persecuted, it both forced the persecution, and it emancipated the Jews when it actually came to power and destroyed the feudal system in France. To, to a degree in England, actually, you know, uh, and, and in the 19th century, that was the emancipation of Jews, the full development of capitalism, you know. So I think, I th yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's a, it, there is a reading back in history of, pre of prejudices of today in, in branding Marx's writings as anti-Semitic, because what he's doing is he's simply commenting on what was the social norm in that period and what he came from a Jewish background. He understood very well what, 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 what the religion uh, was based on. And it was, it, uh, as he said, it's not the, it's the real Jew that made the religion, not the, not the religion that made the Jew. It was a social role that they were forced to play that that modified the religion and made it what it was. Um, sorry, I know I'm being asked to wind up now, so I probably could. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. But I'm, hopefully that makes some sense Thank anyway. You. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. That was interesting. Could, could I come in? Yes, just a second. Uh, no. Did you want us to repli reply to Ian anything, or can we bring? No, in? I'll just make a little input okay. if I may, and then I, I do I have a couple of right. questions for Ian. So. Thanks for promoting me. I don't know if I should say thanks to become a panelist. I was uh, in the audience and uh, I had a few questions for, for Ian, which I'll come to. They're very small and minor. But um, I might say, sitting here in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, two hours later than you, so it's already hang on for 10.30, I go to bed late always midnight, but I've had one a hell of a day on the Gaza issue and Zionists attacking me as self-hating Jew and so on, uh, having to deal with that as we all have to. But the one thing I did want to say and, and, and make maybe a couple of points, um, growing up in South Africa, my, my grandparents were Ashkenazi from Lithuania, 
1900 or so. My father was actually one year old when he came out. My mother was already born here. Um, and there was a working class Jewish uh, sector here, almost like the East End of London, but socially um, mobile upwards as they managed to accrue in South Africa's white people a uh, higher status. And I had some awful uncles who had become so uppity. One of my first, uh, my one uncle was the first Jew in South Africa to join the apartheid uh, national party in uh, something like 1950, the year before my bar mitzvah. And um, he was going to speak at my bar mitzvah. And I refused. I said to my father, no way, he's joined the National Party. We already become a little bit conscious at that stage through having a very, very kind um, parents, working class parents, and uh, a communist cousin who ultimately uh, was arrested for high treason with Mandela and others. What I wanted to say about the so-called anti-Semitism of Marx, um, it was never a feature here in South Africa, except if you went to a university or in high school and you were beginning to get a little interested, as a few of us did, then a very right wing, usually teacher or a professor out of England would say, noticing that there were Jewish boys interested, a couple of us, oh, Karl Marx, was an anti-Semite. So, you know, we'd go and look it up and ask a few people to give us guidance. And it was quite simple, actually, to realize he wasn't. And all the points uh, that Ian has made was provided to us by um, comrades in the Communist Party, like my cousin and others. The interesting thing is that the young Turks of the ANC no less than Nelson Mandela, by the way, who, as they began in the 1940s to exert a militancy out of what had been a very moderate ANC and came along with a very outstanding program of action, they suddenly found that a lot of Black people, working class Blacks, were communist in their outlook. And therefore, for a couple of years before they came to realize the nonsense they spoke, they said that, well, Marxism is a foreign ideology and it's European, it's brought here by the whites. They gave that up very quickly because they were very sensible and they began to realize what the Communist Party was and the Jews from the party, who the Joe Slovos and others who were so committed. The nationalists of the PAC, the more right wing, kept on with that line for many years. Today, they, they wouldn't mention it anymore. So I, I just wanted to throw that into the mix. Um, I also, the second point I wanted to say for this, this, this evening is that the, the crisis now uh, facing the Palestinians and, of course, the, the whole genocidal aspect. As in Britain, everybody now wants to know what the hell Zionism is, more and more. And um, when Tony, I follow Tony all the time, and I saw this series coming on, I thought, I've, I've got to come in. I was in it last week, Tony, and I'm glad to see you're a little better. You were pretty ill last week, comrade, eh? Um, but we really have such an opportunity now, and I know you, you obviously realize it yourself, but here in South Africa, our BDS groups, Palestine Solidarity, which have been very small at times, becoming very energetic uh, with the crises. We had 200,000 people in Cape Town marching a week ago because mainly of Muslim working class people in Cape Town. We've got middle class Muslims in Durban and Joburg, Pretoria. But yesterday we had a tremendous march 
in Johannesburg as well. It's all over South Africa, but at the ideological level, people are really wanting to know and understand um, the question of Zionism. And I've been struggling for years when I was a minister under no less a president than Thabo Mbeki, a highly intellectual person, might have been criticized for certain things, you're not going into that, but I used to find it so frustrating in cabinet and not just with him, um, getting our leading people to understand that Zionism was at the root of the problem in relation to Israel. It's, it's only now that they're beginning to begin to realize the absolute danger of it, given the genocide at this point in time. Um, and Tony, I'm trying to influence comrades to join in this wonderful series that you have, uh, but I'm afraid they very, very busy at the moment. Okay, thanks for the time. I'm coming down to some very simple questions for Ian. Ian, I came in as you were talking about the roots of anti-Semitism in medieval times and earlier, and you talked about the first Jews arriving in England in the 10th century. And I was amazed at that, and I, I wondered where they had originated. Were they Sephardis that they come through from Iberia? Uh, it, it's that kind of movement that I'm pretty interested in. And then the second question where you mentioned the uh, Khazari kingdom in the Caspian Sea, uh, you know, I've, I've read uh, Shlom of Sand and I really promote that book to so many people here. It's absolutely outstanding, especially to Jewish comrades, and we're beginning to get a new generation of young Jews becoming involved. So we have a, a an organization, South African Jews for Palestine, etc. And they they played quite a remarkable role yesterday in the Joburg March, by the way. Every time a, a young Jew or an older Jew, I, I don't speak as a Jew anymore. I'm more of a, of a broader, rounded character. But... Um, Every time, whether it's the Cape Town March, the Joburg March, when a person of a Jewish identity uh, who's very recently involved stands up and we push them and promote them, and they say they are Jewish and what Israel is doing is not in their name, the crowd goes absolutely wild with applause. It's very, very interesting. The Kazari issue then, Ian, what actually happened to those people? I'm, I'm aware of the um, conversion of Jews from an early period of time, converting uh, the people converting into to Judaism, or, the, or, or, or Judaism converting pagans and other people. But I'm interested in the Khazari in terms of where they went. So the Russian Jews and as I've said, that's my background. And I spoke a bit of Russian as a kid through my grandparents, as well as Yiddish, by the way. Um, it's viewed as though the Russian Jews tended to come from Central Europe right? is in that direction. But surely the Khazari who had converted also must have moved into uh, Greater Russia, etc. So, is is that a mix in Russia in relation to the hundreds of people, several million, in fact, who became Jewish? Thanks. Thanks, Ronnie, and thanks for coming on as a panelist. Uh, Ian, do you want to reply? Uh, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. Uh, I, as far as I'm aware, the Jews that came across with William the Conqueror in 1066. Were Jews that were already in Europe. So that's a, an, an illustration of the extent of the diaspora. Uh, whether they'd come from Khazaria, uh, which is which is what one of the hypotheses put forward by Shlomo Sands is that the, the Khazar Jews had migrated into Europe. But I think, uh, I, I'm not sure they would have been Sephardic. 
because they weren't expelled from Al-Andalus until much later. So uh, my guess is that they were either uh, people who had converted to Judaism already in Europe or possibly migrants from Khazaria. But I, I'm not an expert. I don't. I, I can't say for sure. Um, just wanted to make one other little thing about uh, something Ian said about um, other groups forming, um, say, a stratum within um, African society, for example. So you had a, a, a number of people who were, so quite a lot of, Asians uh, living in Africa in, for example, um, Uganda uh, and Kenya. And that, I think, as I understand it, that what's different there is that these groups, uh, as with in South Africa as well, I understand, uh, Asians were often invited uh, by British colonial administrations, British imperialist administrations, uh, to either make up a particular part of a workforce or to make up a, a, or to occupy positions within the imperial civil service and therefore occupied a particular position within, for example, Uganda and uh, Kenya and indeed South Africa. And, and sometimes uh, earned the resentment of African nationalist regimes uh, because they occupied a kind of relatively privileged place re relative to black Africans. But that's quite different uh, to the kind of position that was occupied by the Jews in in early medieval Europe, who who uh, who, who who were this as as you've already as you Ian said uh, in in line with uh, Abraham Leon uh, occupied a a, 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 a a people class. All right. Thanks, Ian, and uh, thanks, Ronnie. And we we actually have quite an international audience, which is. Good, because we're all fighting the same fight and this is a really good time to come together and share experience and develop our understanding together so good to see you see you soon hopefully um william please yeah now the jews in ireland have not had a bad history they've had an excellent history there was always only a handful of jews up until around 1900 and then with some of the programs that they had uh, in Lithuania and in uh, the Baltic countries, they were driven out and they ended up in Ireland. Now, they centred around, mostly around a South Circular Road, around six, six streets of houses they settled and they had their own little uh, community there, which was accepted by everybody because they, they brought in, uh, well, first of all, they brought in a, a variety of bread that the natives wouldn't use to, and then they brought in butcher's shops that the natives wouldn't use to, and then the garment factories, so garments, uh, they were able to maintain garments and things like that. Now, they were very poor to begin with, and uh, probably one of the best examples of a Dublin Jew would be reading Ulysses by James Joyce, because Leopold Bloom who is the main character in Ulysses was a Dublin Jew. And it, there's, there's no mention of anti Semitism in Ulysses at all. As a matter of fact, uh, Leopold Bloom had a ball of a time when he was in Dublin. Now, it's the part of Dublin I come from myself. And my father would have been very close to the Jewish uh, population, uh, the Jewish community, because the Jewish community. It's the only place in Europe that I know of where the Jews actually organised themselves uh, in the uh, during the Nazi period, and when the Irish Nazis were starting off, and they were starting off, it was the Jews that organised the boxing club in the hungry thirties and were able to put money into it to be get equipment and uh, gloves and all sorts of other things as needed for boxing. And it's other progressive elements in the area, including my father. My father would have been in the FENA, which was the youth wing of the IRA at the time. And uh, they all joined, and they used to wait for the Nazis, which were called the Blue Shots. Now, the Blue Shots are in government in Ireland at the moment. Uh, FENA Gale are the Blue Shots. Now, they try and hide that they're not. But they were in the in the nineteen thirties, and they were able to deal with them no problem. Now there was one program in Ireland, a program against Jews that was in Limerick, 
and it was nasty and it was in 1912 and that was after some uh, oh, religious uh, sinners from the Catholic Church uh, started going on about the Jews were the ones that uh, crucified Christ and we should get our own back on behalf of Christ and crucify them and that sort of thing happened and that was the only instance that I know in Ireland where there has been uh, anti-Semitism. The, the actual Jewish community assimilated really very well into Ireland. There's Jews in the judiciary, there's Jews in uh, medical, there's a lot of men into, med into medicine. And some of them I just saw me working with house Jews and they didn't say that they went to the army jobs. Now, also there's a synagogue in Dublin that the Dubliners say is the only Hitler-built synagogue in the world. Now, how that came about was Dublin was bombed uh, by uh, the Luftwaffe in uh, 1941. Initially, they said it wasn't the Luftwaffe, it was the RAF because they assumed that Germans assumed that uh, we'd believe that. And a lot of people at that time did believe it, but then one of the bombs didn't go off. And when the Irish Army dealt with that bomb, it was proven that it was a German bomb. So the German ambassador was called for, I don't know if it was a neutral country. And one of the buildings that was hit was the synagogue. Most coincidental, the, the safest synagogue in Europe gets hit with a stray bomb. So when de Valera got the compensation of the Germans who they paid, he gave the Jews their fair share for, to repair their building. But they added some of their own money to it, and they built a, a, a more elaborate uh, synagogue in a more fashionable part of town, and it is a lovely building. So the only Hitler built synagogue in the world is built is in Dublin. Now there was Jews took uh, part in the 1916 rising, even though they wouldn't have been in Ireland very long before it. They would have been only in Ireland less than 20 years ago. And they participated in the 1916 rising on the Republican side. And then there was a Jew, two Jews from Finland who were members of the uh, IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, that actually deserted off a ship <laughs> during the rising and joined um, the, uh, the, the insurgents in the GPO. One of them actually died. He was he was he was killed in the in the fighting, and that led to a problem. Where was he going to be buried? Because at the time, okay, he could be only buried in the Protestant graveyard, or he could be only buried in a Catholic graveyard. So where were they going to? And then someone said he's a Jew, so he was buried in the Jewish graveyard. But then the people who owned the grave had emigrated to America, and when they one of them died. Uh, an old woman, and she wanted to be buried with her husband. So her body was brought back from New York. And when they opened the grave, they found there was a, there was a strange body in it, because that was the bone for the fellow from there. Right. I'm going to finish, right? I've not gone on forever. Right. And, and uh, the Jews, they, 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 they have a very good history now. Now, the president of Israel at the moment is the son of an Irish Jew, who was the head rabbi in Dublin. Most of the Jews that emigrated since the war, the population, they've gone down. There were 7,000 Jews in my father's time in the 1930s, in around the South Circle Road, where I'm telling you. Now, there's not. The, most of them emigrated to America. Some of them em, were, were Zionists and emigrated to Israel. And the president of Israel at the moment is the son of an Irish Jew. And he, that his father was actually the president of Israel previous to that. This Interesting. Big, yeah. Thank you, William. Thank it was a pleasure just to listen to you. I was just uh, huh? <laughs> you really must have a slot on here at some point. <laughs> John, please. Right. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Ian. I, I I missed the first half an hour of your talk inadvertently, but uh, anyway, um, just um, to cut to the chase. Uh, what I didn't understand before this, and I um, I still don't understand, 
and and that's the difference between the Jewish experience of Western Europe and the Jewish experience of Eastern Europe. Um, you uh, you pointed out that um, in early feudalism in Western Europe, um, the Jews played a trading role, and what grew out of that later on as feudalism began to be replaced or at least um, get mixed in with mercantile capital that the the Jewish role changed and became a bit more specific around uh, money lending and early banking and so on um, when you talked about the um, Jews uh, being ousted from England and from Western Europe through the, through the Crusades, which I knew about, and going to the East, going to the, the pale part of the, of the Romanov Empire, which essentially was Ukraine and, and Poland, as I understand it, um, that there was a feudal society, you said. Now, but whereas the Jews were able to thrive in the West within an early feudal society, it seems they were not able to, to thrive within the feudal society in Eastern Europe. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't hear an explanation for that. Um, maybe you can't give one, but, but um, um, I do wonder about that and what the... And, and also going on from that a little bit, uh, I do know that Eastern Europe generally remained in the early part of the 20th century, a very, very underdeveloped agricultural zone, and to some extent still is. Um, the the um, What role did economically uh, Jews have within those societies uh, before the Second World War? Um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, in East, uh, so Jews were effectively being forced eastwards by uh, the fact that the market and capitalism was developing in the West. So um, Jews were being forced out of the, the, the roles that they previously had in banking and trade and so on. Um, and so moved eastwards. And so there was a period of, of absolute flourishing in Eastern Europe, particularly in Poland, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, um, in, in those kinds of areas. Some Jews were connected with farming, but not, not a great many. Most were connected with um, banking and, and commerce of one sort or another. But remember, this is... Um, this is mar uh, mercantile capital, not 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 capitalism proper. Um, fr from that point of view, uh, there was the antagonism that grew, grew up between um, Jews who might have been intermediaries between nobles and peasants. So they might have been tax farmers, effectively tax collectors, uh, on behalf of nobles, and they were tolerated by nobles in the context of Eastern Europe. Once Jews began to be allowed back into Western Europe, uh, they tended to be quite assimilated. Uh, and so if you think of someone like Sigmund Freud, for example, living in Vienna, um, very much the non-Jewish Jew, uh, very much influenced by his Jewish heritage, but not a, a not religious practicing Jew. Um, if we think of the, the way in which Jews were assimilated in, in England, for example, uh, after, after Cromwell, um, tended to be quite prosperous initially. Uh, if you see, there's an interesting kind of representation of a Jew in some of William Hogarth's work, you know, an engraving in the 18th century. Uh, so relatively prosperous. It's not until the 19th century that it's the poor Jews coming to uh, Britain and elsewhere forced out by pogroms in the East, because by then capitalism is, is fully advanced into Eastern Europe as well. And um, but of course the uh, the assimilation of Jews in Western Europe uh, was all came to be challenged, and it actually raises the 
the contradiction that exists in capitalism. Uh, the Dreyfus case is, is was of course the the, the famous one uh, where on the one hand. Uh, uh, liberal democracy is supposed to be concerned with the, the 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 freedom of the individual, the citizen, the owner of property, even if it's just their their their, their labor power. Um, but that contradiction is exposed in a sense by the Dreyfus case and becomes the basis then for. Uh, uh, it wasn't just the Dreyfus case that motivated Theodore Herzl, but it was definitely a factor saying you know we can't therefore have a place within. Uh, Within within Western liberal society, um, but the Eastern Jews um, went through the same kind of process of of, of immiseration, really, of being forced into uh, the interstices of capitalist society rather than uh, assuming their full uh, re assuming the the important role that they previously had in a feudal society. Um, does, that, does that answer it? I think does that makes sense. Sorry, I've muted you. If you want to say something, you have to press unmute again. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Ian, I, I, I understand that, that but I, I'm not sure the extent of uh, industrial capitalism that, that was present at the time of the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Um, the, the impression I've had from my reading is that uh, it was not developed until a hundred years later, really, that it was still a very agrarian, rural part of the world, essentially. Uh, certainly Russia was at the time of the revolution, um, had a very small industrial sector just around uh, a, a few major cities. Um, presumably that was the same in uh, Poland, B Belarus, and uh, Ukraine. So I don't really see how the, the antagonism to Jews, which happened on such a scale in Eastern Europe, how that arose there from within the population. Uh, it wasn't a fully fledged capitalist society, or was it? Uh, no, not fully fledged. I mean, certainly not industrial. And where you do have industrialization, it's interesting where uh, the, the Jews didn't end up evenly distributed through in, in um, through the in industrial process, as it were. So they would tend to be concerned with particular areas of consumption goods, so uh, textiles, for example, uh, or you know, so consumer goods, really, rather than say metallurgy. Or you know, so you didn't you didn't get many Jewish blacksmiths, but you would get a Jewish tailor that kind of thing, uh, but also uh, being forced out of their previous roles as, as kind of bankers and end up as doing as being um, uh, shopkeepers or shopkeepers who then uh, 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 sold food on tick. So, you know, so you ended up in debt uh, to a Jewish shopkeeper. Um, and Abraham Leon talked at one point about uh, some of the anti-Semitism in Poland in uh, the 1920s. Uh, where, <laughs> where, where being a shopkeeper was 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 synonymous with being a Jew. So he tells this story about a, a woman telling his uh, telling her son to, uh, to to go to the go to the Jew, but, we, uh, but don't go to the Jew who is a Jew. Go to the Jew that's a Pole, <laughs> um, because there become a, an association between sort of minor usury, minor lending, either associated with publicans. Uh, or associated with um, uh, small shopkeepers or pawnbrokers. So from that point of view, the antagonism between um, the Polish peasantry and proletariat uh, was with that that stratum of, of impoverished Jews, but were still related in some way with trade. The other thing was that there was a, a Jewish proletariat, and of course it was the Jewish proletariat that was being represented by the Bund, among others. Um, but the Bund, of course, were important in, uh, they were resolutely anti-Zionist, and that, that's the importance of, of them as well. Uh, Zionism was a kind of, very few Jews before uh, World War II were, were, were Zionist. And, and that fascism itself, of course, only really comes into being because of this being caught between the hammer and anvil of, of, of 
decaying feudalism and, and rotting capitalism. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, I think that's the, the, the basis of the antagonism. And then, and of course, the other place where Jews were often found was in liberal professions. Uh, I remember coming across this statistic about the number of doctors in Berlin. Um, the, the, the Jewish population of Germany at the start of World War II was less than 1%. But something like thirty percent of of doctors in Berlin were were Jewish, and and a higher proportion of doctors in Germany joined the National Socialists. Uh, there were a lot of petty bourgeois elements, of course, in um, the Nazi Party. But it's kind of tempting to conclude that um, German doctors were trying to eliminate their competitors. That's a bit of a stretch, maybe, <laughs> but uh, let's not <laughs> go down that road at the moment. But thank you very much, Ian. That was a really fascinating session. There were really good comments in the in the chat. Your best session yet. Oh. You've certainly done a lot of a lot of work and uh, become an expert. See, preparing for this session that was brilliant. Thank you very much, um, comrades. We'll we'll be revisiting questions like Zionism. Uh, Tony will be joining us uh, for three sessions uh, to discuss Zionism before the Holocaust, after, and during the Holocaust as well. So that'd be interesting because Ian just touched on it, how it's changed and how it's been used um, for uh, its own purpose, etc. We'll also look at the Holocaust Industry, the book by Norman Finkelstein. We tried to got tried to get Norman Finkelstein himself, but he is super busy. If anybody who knows who signed up to his uh, email uh, uh, list thing, we'll we'll see. He's on. He was just on Piers Morgan, etc. So I'm afraid I don't think he's got time for us. But we'll look at his book anyway because it was a really important book that explained why um, the Holocaust be, became like an, a whole industry. And uh, we're looking at that next week. It's going to be really interesting as well. Uh, Yasmin Martha from Hands of the People of Iran will be looking at Hamas, where it comes from, how it's developed, et cetera, which role it plays, what kind of program it has. And we'll probably end up discussing as well our attitude to Hamas and what happened on October, October the 7th. So that'd be a, a different kind of in interesting discussion, but uh, interesting nevertheless. Thank you very much for, for joining us with over 100 people again in the audience is certainly a, an interesting subject that need, needs exploring and we'll have hundreds of other people watching this these videos online and uh, we'll continue with it. If any of you have any ideas for additional sessions, uh, we can always extend it, etc. So just get in touch info at ymarks.com. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, comrades. See you next week. Bye bye.